Good morning. Uh, this morning we're beginning the fifth commandment. And if you remember in the Ten Commandments, we often describe them as two tables of the law. The first four commandments deal primarily with uh, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the last six commandments have an emphasis toward loving our neighbor as ourself. Um, the, the law is a, a unit, a whole, and when you love God in the first four commandments, you will be loving your neighbor, and when you love your neighbor as God commands in the, six, the last six commandments, you will be loving God. So there is a distinction in the Bible, but also unity. So I, I hope that's not lost on you as we consider one another with the fifth commandment. And remember that the fifth commandment is the first commandment in the last six. And remember that its emphasis is on loving our neighbor. And as we begin to unpack it and go through the other commandments, uh, come with soft hearts so that we can grow in our understanding of God's commandments for us and His will with reference to how to live the Christian life by faith. Okay. I, I've, there should be a handout that's been passed around. It has two sides to it. And it's broken up into four catechism questions. The first is, which is the fifth commandment? Uh, the second is, what is required in the fifth commandment? The third is, what is forbidden in the fifth commandment? commandment and what is the reason annexed to the fifth commandment is the fourth one. Okay. This, these notes up here are partial notes for the first question. So if you're a note taker and want to save this, you can go ahead and begin to write some of this down. And let me just begin by reading that. Which is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Exodus twenty twelve. What I would like to do this morning is focus and go a little in depth on the scope of this commandment. I was reading uh, Peter Masters on the Ten Commandments and he was focusing on an aspect of this commandment applied to the church because he said that most people understand it applied to the family and that's not disputed very often, but not many people seriously consider how this commandment applies to other areas outside of the family. Uh, it does say, honor your father and your mother. So, it's not excluding the parents. It starts there. Uh, but it's going to be more broad, and I want to show you that. And also, if you're wondering, as we go through this first question, why we don't cover the last half of this commandment, that your days may be long, and so forth, it's because it's addressed in the fourth question. What is the reason annexed to the fifth commandment? So, I'm not going to focus on the second half of the commandment. I'm focusing on those six words, honor your father and your mother. Okay, so where in the Bible outside of Exodus 20.12 do we see that God commands us to honor our natural paternal or parent, parental authority? I say it that way if you look up here, natural, um, and you could 
take that too far. That's why I put it in quotes. It's looking at your physical parents. Okay, uh, so Pastor Michael, what verse were you thinking? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. I could read it if you'd like. Yes, yes, please read that. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 3. Um, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. It, um, can, I, I just want to make a comment, like in my, in my reading of the commandments, when it, um, you know, especially like t- talking about the fourth commandment and how there were specific aspects of the fourth commandment for Israel in redemptive history. Um, it's interesting how, you know, Paul here, he re- he's referring to the fifth commandment, but um, it's not something that is particularly for the land uh, for the people of Israel in that time in redemptive history like it's clear that he is appealing to that commandment he says uh this is the first commandment with a promise um that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the in the land and he's speaking to like a predominantly gentile church in in Ephesus it's very very interesting yes amen um so that promise is not just limited to Jews in the day that they received it as they would consider the land of Canaan. It applies today to Gentiles in America. Yeah, amen. Okay, any, any other verses that come to mind? Uh, Brenda? In Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Amen. We have Colossians 3.20. Let's also look at um, Proverbs 23, verses 22 and 25. Let me read that. Listen to your father who begot you. And do not despise your mother when she is old. So you can see how the commandment does narrowly focus on your biological parent. Parents. If you don't have a biological parents, you're adopted, your parents who adopted you, or your legal parents, they're the ones who, within the sphere of the family, have parental authority over you. Look at also 25. Let your father and your mother be glad and let her who bore you rejoice. And then let's look briefly at Hebrews 12, verse 9. Furthermore, we had human fathers. So that's where I get natural from. Human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not more, much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Okay. Let me add that reference up here. So why do we go over those texts? It's to show the commandment in other places in Scripture and to 
further reinforce that the commandment does in its scope apply to your parents. And that's, that's not really like uh, confusing or disputed by many people. Uh, but it is good for us to see texts and to be reminded that it is throughout. And also, if you will, remember that in the Ten Commandments, they're per synecdoche. Uh, if you've never heard that figure of speech, it means uh, we use a part. We, we use a part for the whole. Um, when I say uh, copper, and I'm talking about change, I'm talking about the material, but I mean the pennies. Or, um, I can't think of another one off the top of my head, but we'll, we'll use in our figure of speech a part. We'll say a part, but we mean the whole thing. And the commandments are like that. God will, in its published form, deliver it to us in His Word, and He's hitting on a part, but that part is representative of the whole. And what God is hitting on in this commandment it, the part that He chose to give us is our biological family. That's the part that He wanted it to be front and center. But it's a part for the whole. What's the whole of the commandment? Does it stop just with our parents? Like when I go to work and I am have an employer, when I, if I'm in the military and I have a sergeant, if I'm here at church with my elders and they direct me in the way to go or uh, admonish me in the way not to go, does it apply there? Yes, it does. So I want, I want you to be convinced of that from the Scripture. And the reason why I think it's important that you see it in Scripture is the age in which we live. Uh, we live in a very perverse generation with respect to authority. We are very uh, egalitarian. Uh, we are the land of the free. And we carry equality to degrees we ought not. Uh, even with authority, and we justify rebellion against God's appointed authorities. Uh, we're, um, so, I want you to be convinced as God's people what God commands and you to see that the scope is very broad. And that's the next point. Broadly, we're looking at what is the fifth commandment and we're looking at its scope. Its scope includes the natural parental authority, but broadly speaking, its scope includes authority belonging to everyone in the several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. And I know that that's long, but I'm getting that from the catechism. I think it's helpful. I could have... I could have just focused on church, state, and family. But that still is limited. It goes down to inferiors and equals. So, one way I want to begin to demonstrate this from Scripture is let's do a, a biblical survey of the terms father and mother and in what context they're used. Okay. Any questions so far? Sergio? I was going to ask uh, in regards to like inferiors or equals, how, how would that um, play out as far as um, honoring you know, yeah, as far as the commandment. Uh, I'll give you an example if you'll turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. It 
So the, uh, I think the question was heard because he had the microphone. I was going to repeat it. So Pastor Michael read verses 1 and through 3. Uh, but if you look in verse 4, there's the other end. Not only are the children to obey, but in, in, in this particular authorial, authoritarian, I don't know how to word that, uh, authority, the authority structure between a father and a child. Not only does the Bible address the child and how they ought to relate to the father and his authority as father, but the Bible addresses the father in that authority, authoritative role and how he ought to address the child. And if you look in verse 4, and you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So this commandment, when we get into its broader reach, it's not, imp- it, it, I know per synecdoche, it's part for the whole. It focuses on the inferior honoring the superior in authority. I don't mean like quality. Like one's less value than another. When I say inferior and superior, I'm talking about authority only. So, yes, the Bible, when it publishes the commandment on Sinai and puts it in tablets, it's directed at those who have the inferior role and how they relate to those who have the superior role. But when we look at the commandment in its broad sense, in its scope, it does the vice versa. It also commands the father in how he ought to relate to his children. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, another example of like um, honoring um, with um, equality, those, those in equality as far as it goes uh, with authority it be Romans 12.10. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, so, so, so those who may not um, hold a position of authority like a mother to her children, a father to his children, or maybe a pastor to his, his church, um, say, you know, a good application is amongst members of a church who, who, do, who don't hold a position of authority in the church, they are to honor one another. They are equal in regards to authority, and they're called here to outdo one another in showing honor, and particularly honoring one another, as it said, uh, love one another with a brotherly affection. I want to look up synecdoche now. <laughs> Is it, okay, I, will, I really want, because Sergio's question, it makes me want to re-emphasize what that meant by that figure of speech, per synecdoche. Synecdoche, what does that mean? Here is an example. When I, when I use the word bread, they got their bread. They might not have even had bread at all. What I meant is their food. Or maybe they got bread with a bunch of other food. I'm using that word bread to to talk about food. So another one. I might, instead of referencing the army and say the whole army, I might just say soldier. And then I told you the copper for a penny. A penny is more than just copper. It actually takes a particular form and has an imprint on it. Instead of saying penny, I say copper. So when we get the commandments, the Ten Commandments, it's not um, the way it's revealed. It's not an, an exhaustive verbal explanation of what it requires. It's a part. And I, I would say the most preeminent part, the way that God focuses on publishing it that way. But it is still a part for the whole And it's up to us through Scripture to learn what is the whole. And 
what I'm telling you, and maybe you're not, maybe y'all have, we haven't, maybe you haven't thought about this, is that when we get into the hole, it doesn't just address children to parents. And it doesn't just address inferiors to superiors. It addresses superiors to inferiors. Just, just thinking about uh, what you're saying. Um, when, so at the time it was given in the Old Testament, you know, uh, Exodus 20, uh, would the people of Israel would have understood that broader sense at the time or only the superior-inferior relationship? I think that they... I think our understanding of the Ten Commandments is very dependent on our relationship to God by the Spirit. So I would think that there were many Jews who probably didn't see it as they ought. But uh, Jesus indicts, you know, the Pharisees when he comes. And he says, I tell you, this is what it means. It's always meant, always meant that, and I don't think it was concealed. It's just the, from the hardness of the hearts of men, we like to lower God's standards all the time so that we can boast in our own righteousness. So, but did God make it uh, in His Word? Did He reveal that He meant more? Yes. And that's why. Let's, let's go. Let's look at the survey of, of the terms father and mother now. Okay. So we already looked at natural. Those texts up there. Now I want to show you how the word father or mother gets used with reference to rulers. And I'm going to give you the references, but because of the sake of not having a lot of room, you'll have to write them down as we we go over them. So let's turn to Genesis 45, verse 8. This is Joseph. He revealed himself to his brothers. And I'm going to read from verse 8. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. He didn't become the biological father of an Egyptian. But yet, he says, I'm like a father. And if, if you would say, it's, it, he narrowly is focused on Pharaoh when he says, I'm a father to Pharaoh, and this isn't the best application for ruler, we'll go to another text. But what you can see is the usage of the word father not meaning biological So when the commandment comes to Pharaoh, honor your father and your mother, he has a peculiar relationship to Joseph and he ought to honor him in the authority that he's given him. That God has given him. Let's look at Judges 5.7. And because of Pastor Mark's preaching, I'm sure you're fam more familiar uh, or refreshed on Judges. You remember what Judges uh, focuses on, more of the context. Well, we haven't got there yet, but one of the Judges who comes along is Deborah uh, in place of Balak, ba Barak. So look at Judges 5. Verse 7. Village life ceased, it ceased in Israel, until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. So, you can see how the word mother gets used with reference to Deborah because she has a peculiar authority 
in her relation to Israel. Y'all see that? So this commandment, when God gives it, He does not just intend your natural parental authority. He intends other fathers and other mothers. Look at Isaiah 49, verse 23. I'm still showing you rulers. Isaiah 49, 23. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Um, The relationship here to see is how God likens kings to fathers and queens to mothers. What are some of the rulers in our land? Either our city, our state, or our our nation. Ben? (laughs) Uh, Like commissioner, mayor, governor, uh, president, state. uh, Yeah. All those guys yeah. in the command. We have a lot of fathers in that sense. It's metaphorical, but the commandment applies to them. God is not afraid to call people in place of ruling fathers and mothers. And though they're not our biological parents, they relate to us in their authority like a father or like a mother. I know that there's sin in various rulers. And God requires of them to relate to their citizens a particular way, but He also requires us to honor them. I was just thinking, I want to ask a question. So, so the fifth, so the fifth commandment really could be applied, you know, um, like the passage in Romans where it says, "Be subject to the governing authorities," right? So, say some, somebody who doesn't want to pay taxes, you know, or wants to break the law of the land in some way. Like it would be a legitimate use and application of the fifth commandment to quote and command them to honor their their father and their mother in that regards. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If, if, if you, like, that, that's a good application. Like, it, it goes so broad. Like, when you sit down to do your taxes on TurboTax or you sit across from a, an accountant and you start telling them things and they're drumming up ways, uh, ex- exaggerating or inciting you to exaggerate or you're not sure but yet you're providing information as if it's true. That's not honoring them. And that is a violation of the fifth commandment. Um, You wouldn't do that to your pastor. You wouldn't do that to your biological dad. Dad, where's your wallet? And then take money out and steal it. We don't have the freedom in God's law to steal. I mean, we can go to, the, we can go to theft, but the, the, the honor that we ought to have towards our rulers is um, governed by the fifth commandment. Um, you know, it, it, we could go to other areas too, like uh, law enforcement. You know, um, we're not getting into the nature of what it means to honor today. I want to look at that term, but we're going to, with the other commandments, what is required, what is forbidden. We're going to look at the, the nature of it and how it would look when you honor them. But just in principle, when you meet an officer who's on duty, 
uh, he has a particular authority over you as a citizen of this nation or county, and you are to relate to him according to the fifth commandment and honor him. And, it, and it's not necessarily because intrinsically there's worth in him. He could be a very vile man, but it's by virtue of the position that he has in, re, in your relationship to him. Okay, let's look at uh, military chiefs. If you'll turn to 2 Kings 5.13. Second Kings 5.13 And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So this is uh, Naaman. Uh, he was, if you look in chapter 5, verse 1, he was commander of the army of the king of Syria. And he's being told by the prophet how he can be cleansed of his leprosy. But you can see how the servants, multiple servants come to him and they call him Father. So this commandment applies to people who are in position in military. Let's look at prophets. 2 Kings 2.12 And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. So you can see how Elisha references Elijah, the prophet. He calls him, My father, my father. So the Bible will, will use the term father with reference to one relating to another as, as their prophet or as a prophet. Just teachers, uh, wisdom teachers, you can get that name. If you look at Psalms, Psalm 34, 11. I say it this way, I don't, you could relate it to ruler because of David's place in relation to others, uh, but I put it there, um, I think that it's not bad to do that because he's talking about how I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And it doesn't say father, but he references all those who listen as children. Come, you children, listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Uh, giftings. Someone who is gifted by God to be skilled at something. Look at Genesis 4. This could be like trade, trade work. Um, some trades like today, like welding. Uh, photography, uh, engineering, um, and I want to show you in this context, Genesis 4, 20 through 21, and Ada bore Jabel, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock.
basketball. Those who dwell in tents. And if you keep going, you can see how this is related to their giftings because the next one, it says his brother's name was Jubal. He, he was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. So it's dealing with a trade, a skill. It's not biological. It's just those who play the harp and flute. As for Zilla, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So you can see there how uh, instead of using the word father, it's using the word instructor. So we're going father, father, instructor, because they're synonyms here. Uh, in other words, when you're under someone's tutelage, they relate to you metaphorically like a father. And you ought to honor them insofar as they have authority in their skill and ability to teach you. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think out loud here. If someone is, um, has placed themselves in authority that's not ordained by God, um, are we still to hold to this, this particular point of the command? I'm thinking through when Christ tells some of the Jewish people that they're of their father, the devil. Mm -hmm. um, he... He's, he's not ordained by God in any way, shape, or form as an authoritative figure. So if someone were to do that in another land and say, nope, I'm your governor or whatever, should those people still be applying this? No is the quick answer. But because of sin, uh, we each, even as believers, have this proneness to want to throw off authority. And we need to be careful that when we are not going to honor someone in a position of authority, that we have biblical warrant for it. So, you know, if someone comes along and says, I'm, your, I'm now your king, uh, well, I can and recognize that this is just a self-proclaimed king and I'm not obligated to honor him as my king. Yeah, I was just thinking while he was talking. Like, when we talk about honoring and not honoring, even if we don't honor someone because of kind of a situation that you guys are describing, there's a godly way to do that. Yeah. So, like, when we say that we're not going to honor somebody <laughs> who holds, like, some false position of authority, what we're not saying is that we're going to, in some ungodly way, give them dishonor, right? Like, that's oh, right. not what we're saying. What we're saying is we're not recognizing the authority that they're holding, and we're responding to it as Christians, whatever yeah. that looks like in that situation. Yeah, uh, thank you. So... And that brings us back to what is the summary of the law? It's to love. Love God and love your neighbor. So even when they're not in particular authority over me and they're trying to impose it upon me, uh, I still, as an equal, need to relate to them as God commands. So even though it doesn't deal with him as a superior, it does deal with him as an equal. So I need to honor him as an equal now, not as a superior. And what does the Bible say about how to do that? Um, it, it, and to be a little more specific, remember who they are. They are a man or a woman made in the image of God. Uh, I need to consider how I relate to the Lord and then how I relate to his image bearer, even when they're sinning against me. So, amen.
It's, it's, and we've got to remember, like, our heart is, should be to love God and love others. We can't do that apart from the Lord. He must give us a new heart and cause us by the work of His Spirit to be motivated to do that. But as He works in us, we obey. And if you remember, like, our disposition is to love others. Our dis- disposition is to love them biblically. So, I, my disposition is not to isolate from people and to hate them. And God's keeping me under uh, some kind of ball and chain to relate to certain people a certain way. And as soon as the chains broke, I can just run in my separation from you and be an enemy. The disposition is, how can I love you? Okay, well, you're not over me as an authority, but I can love you as an equal, and authority-wise. Okay, um, let's look at church leaders. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. I hope this is helpful for you to, to begin to meditate on the law of God and to consider what God requires of you with reference to other spheres of authority in your life. I think when we think about this commandment, we don't immediately run to all these other areas. We just kind of run to our immediate parents and that's it. And we just stop. And we don't think about it when we speak ill of our president. I know that there are corrupt people in office, but that doesn't give you warrant to speak ill of them because God has given them that authority. Uh, And that's going to get it, the word honor. You know, I want to get to that word. Um, so let's look at 1 Corinthians 4.15 for all things are for your sakes is, is it? no I'm reading 2 Corinthians um, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ yet you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus I be- I have begotten you through the gospel. So this is Paul in reference his peculiar relationship to Corinth. He was an he is was an apostle, and God used the gospel and Paul, having preached it to them, to save many in Corinth, and they had a particular relationship to him as apostle and church leader, as metaphorically a father. So the commandment applies to them, how they relate to Paul. Tyler? So, um, I don't remember where it is, but um, where I think Paul says um, uh, that we have, maybe it's in um, Titus chapter 2, I don't remember, but where he says that we have um, spiritual fathers, or like in in Mark, where Jesus says, "You you know, you leave your father and your uh, you, you know you leave your friends and everybody, but then um, you gain a hundred fathers and a hundred mothers." Is he speaking about? He he's not talking about people that are older than you in the church. He's talking about people who are in positions of authority over you in the church. Oh, in that text where Jesus said that, I'm not, not necessarily, but okay. you know, just the concept. Yeah, there, there are, uh, in that text that Jesus did, I think he didn't use the word fathers, he used mothers and brothers. Um, but that's not really what your question is. Does the Bible use the word fathers with reference to church leaders? Is that the right way to ask that? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, in, he, in the church. it does. It does uh, um, and it, sometimes you don't always see it as, I'm a father metaphorically, and I know that it's not, I'm, I'm just adding it. Um, sometimes he'll say, you are my child, my son. If you look at Galatians 4.19, 
uh, Paul says, my little children, and now you can bring into context or into your memory all those texts where the apostles call them my little children, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. And then look at 1 Timothy 1, 2. Is that helping? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm asking for myself because if people older than me in the church are my father, everybody's my father, you know. <laughs> oh, so, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, is it my church leaders? Okay, is, I, you know, I got it, you. Uh, the Bible does, and that's one of the ones I want to go to is older people. Um, the Bible does liken older people as metaphorical parents. And it likens church leaders who actually have offices within the church as metaphorical parents. So uh, the Bible would apply to both. The commandment applies to both. And there's distinctions. It's not like, okay, well everybody has the all these different roles and spheres of my life, church, state, work, home. And now they're all even. That's not true. Uh, we need biblical wisdom to know how to apply when it, things aren't easy. You know, like I was listening to uh, Jeff Smith and he was talking about how at a former church that he was a member of, there were certain leaders who had been discovered embezzling money with the church funds. And there were other believers or members in the church who did not want to go to the state with the, the crime, thinking that it only was a church matter. So I know this is opening a can of worms, and I'm not planning to address it today uh, in its more interworkings. I'm just trying to make a point that everything's not even. And when they recognize not only have they dishonored in a very grievous way the authority that they had over the people and therefore are subject to church discipline, they also are subject to civil disciplinary action uh, because of their... Uh, sub, their uh, relation to civil authorities. But uh, there are many things that civil authorities, they don't have any right. They don't have a right to come into your home and tell you not to pray. So our, all these spheres of authority are limited. And that really brings me back to the ultimate authority is God. This commandment deals with God. He, I mean, uh, God is, uh, the, the very word Father gets its meaning from God. Um, the moment we try to define fatherhood apart from Him, we're already false. So, and he, His authority is ultimate. So if someone in any sphere is commanding you to dishonor God the Father, or uh, dishonor, um, dishonor another authority. Um, then you can disobey that authority if they're commanding you to sin, and it would have to be bibli a biblical basis, because God is is who we ultimately are subject to. And we're subject to one another because we're subject to Him. That's why, it's, that's why Paul brings out in Romans 13, the governing authorities are from God. They're God's ministers. You know why you should obey them? Because God put them there. You know why we, aren't, we, are, we are to treat Donald Trump with honor in the way we speak about him? is because God put him there. Okay, uh, let's... Church leaders, uh, let me just read this for time's sake. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, Paul said to Timothy, a true son in the faith. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, 
grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus, or no, I'm sorry, to Titus, a true son in our common faith. And then there's older people. I'd say uh, it's in effect, 1 Timothy 5.1. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. That's physically an older man. He's just older than me. I need to treat him as I would a father. And then if you go back to, just carrying with that, Leviticus 19 Verse 32, it was in the Old Covenant. God even said this. You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. I am the Lord. You think about like how that's just completely forgotten. Uh, age is very, very much disrespected. In, uh, in my experience. Um, but, but God is telling the, the Israel, I want you to stand up and I want you to honor the presence of a gray-haired man. So, the commandment is broad. Broad. And this last point is bringing it back to what we've already brought it back to. God is our ultimate Father. Our definition of fatherhood comes from Him. Our abject, absolute submission is to God the Father. All other authorities submit. All other fathers submit underneath His fatherhood. And to to kind of wrap things up, what are superiors? I have just did a survey of the biblical terms father and mother. But, but here's some more categories. for. We've already kind of discussed them. Your parents. Church officers, pastors and deacons, they're your fathers. Civil officers, political, law enforcement, military, they're your fathers and mothers. Employers and masters, they are your fathers and mothers. Older people, as we've shown. And for those of you who have people under you, this commandment applies to you with reference to those inferior in authority. Your children. Church members. So officers have a particular relationship to their members. They need to shepherd the flock of God and tend to the lambs. The commandment addresses them and tells them how to relate as uh, in their positions of authority. Citizens, if, no matter what political office you have, you have a particular obligation in your authority to minister to those citizens. Employees, slaves, servants, younger people. You know, with our children, the commandment applies to how we relate to the children in this church just because they're younger. You're older. You need to be careful how you father them. And then equals. So maybe there is no authority difference between you and your brother or you and the person on the street. But they are made in the image of God. And let me last read James 2.19. You believe that... Uh, is that so 3, nine, James 3.9. I'm going to start in 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, our equals, who have been made in the similitude of God. He's talking about the duplicity. You, you honor God with your mouth, and then you speak evil of your neighbor. But they're made in the image of God. It's duplicitous. Why we, not, why we honor God and then not honor the one that's made in His image? So even equals deserve an honor from us because of who they are made in God's image. And I could go to 1 Peter where he says, honor all men. 
So I'll leave it there. We'll pick up with the word honor next time. What does it mean? And then go from there to the next catechism question. Any questions? Okay. Yep. It comes from the literal word to weigh much or be heavy. So I, I like the NET. Honor is to give parents, and I'm using it in the broad sense, respect and honor that is appropriate for them. It could be said this way give them the weight of their authority that they deserve. Don't, when you go and you say, man, this thing, this iron weight that I'm carrying, this 45 pound weight, it is heavy, you know? Well, when you go over here and you say, man, his office, my employer, my boss, his, his position over me is, is like a feather. I don't mean anything to me. You know, it's, it's weighty. It has weight to it. You need to carry, care about the weight and, fee, and, and attribute in your understanding and in your heart much weight to that position that he has over you. Okay. Let's pray and we'll, we'll close. Father in heaven, we praise you. Uh, for the clarity of your word. Uh, Thank you for teaching us, your people, uh, having been given new hearts, how we ought to honor others, our parents. Please help us, Lord, not lose sight of the broadness of this and the scope of this in our own lives, but to put on new obedience and to put off uh, our sin with reference to honoring those that you have put in our pl- and, and over us or under us and even our equals. In Christ's name I pray, amen.